Dr. Guido Holzman is a Mises Institute Senior Fellow and Professor of Economics at the University of Angers in France. He wrote the comprehensive biography of Ludwig von Mises, an enormous project that gave him unique insights into the mind, work, and life of this 20th century giant. Dr. Holzman subsequently also wrote a fascinating book about the ethics of money production, a topic inspired by Mises himself. We discussed Dr. Holzman's years spent writing the biography, the serendipitous discovery of Mises' papers in Moscow that made the book possible, how Mises endured and kept working as Europe burned, and how his personal sacrifices helped pave the way for Austrian academics working today. Stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Mises Weekends. I'm Jeff Deist. Very happy and pleased to be joined this week and in studio by a guest visiting us here at the Mises Institute in Auburn, Dr. Guido Holzman. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing very fine. It's a great pleasure to be at the Mises Institute. Guido, your book, The Ethics of Money Production, was published just about a year after your Mises biography. Did your time spent studying Mises inspire you to write the book? In a way, yes, but not in the way you would expect it. This was rather a therapeutical activity. So I could not fully focus on the Mises biography because it was really a lot of work in the sense that I did not really feel um, as as a historian or thought that was not my main uh, passion uh, as, a, as, a, as a as a scholar, which was always economics. So uh, writing a Mises biography was an unusual. Uh, activity and I had to learn a l- many things. So of course, it was very instructive. I got much more educated about many questions, but it was really hard work in the sense that often I didn't find much pleasure in doing it. Uh, I mean, writing uh, the biography was uh, uh, provided pleasure, but I mean, researching all those things, that was uh, a lot of hard work. Uh, so on the other hand, so then to just let steam off, I uh, always was carrying on some economic research. So I was writing uh, articles uh, that were published in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics and other uh, scientific uh, journals, but also uh, then the the ethics of money production, and that was uh, in fact in a, in a way it is due to the initiative of one of the supporters of the Mises Institute, the late George Crispin, uh, whom you might have uh, known. So George uh, moved with his uh, very charming wife uh, Teresa to Auburn at some point in the in the late 1990s. He had been an engineer for for many decades before. And so he was uh, constantly present and he showed up at our uh, seminars and at the Mises Summer University and uh, uh, also at the events that we organized for the students that were here uh, the year long in Auburn. And at one point in 2003, he asked me whether I would be willing to uh, run a seminar for him and his friends. In, in, in some profession, I, I wonder whether it was the Rotary Club or something, or the Lions Club, something of this sort. No, no I agreed. Yes, why not? So they, they wanted to have a seminar on monetary economics. So I went with them through the history of, uh, of monetary thought. And so I had all the lecture notes already provided, uh, and then the Mises Institute graciously uh, accepted to publish it. Guido, your biography of Mises is entitled Mises, The Last Night of Liberalism. Now, I know that this was an enormous undertaking, a project that took you many years. Can you go back in time and tell us a little bit about that process? It, it is a huge project. So uh, yesterday, some students asked me if I would accept it again. I think it might have been Flora Lilly, right? She asked me, would you accept to do it again? I said, if somebody asked me now, I would say no. Right? <laughs> no. <laughs> would you do it again? <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, knowing how much work was involved, no. So, and of course, it's, it's very different because now I'm um, an established scholar, so I have many other things uh, I can do and many other things how I can earn my, my living. So when Lou asked me to uh, write a Mises biography, it came just at the right moment of my career because I did not yet have uh, an, an academic uh, position. Anyway, I was not yet a professor. I did not have a, a, a revenue coming from uh, giving lectures, uh, teaching students, carrying on research. So it came r- just about the right uh, point of time. I wanted to go back into academia and I had obtained two scholarships uh, 
1996 from uh, two German uh, f uh, science foundations, which are the equivalent to the National Foundation for the Sciences or something like this, so very prestigious stuff. So, And with one I went to France and the other one I went to, to the United States. And just at about the same time when I heard that I had been uh, accepted uh, for these grants, Lou asked me whether I would be willing to write a Mises biography which was because I knew Austrian economics and because I could read the original material uh, in, uh, in German especially, and some of it is also in French. The reason why he asked me was because just before it had become known that the documents that Mises carried in his Vienna apartment, in, which had been confiscated by the Nazis in 1938, had been rediscovered in Moscow, out of all places. So the Red Army had discovered all this material uh, stocked in a Nazi uh, train wagon, in fact, at the end of the war, and they brought all of this to, to Moscow. They were not particularly interested in Mises, but Mises' papers were stocked with uh, lots of other similar archives that belong to uh, regime opponents, so either uh, liberals like Mises or uh, communists and, and various uh, Jewish organizations and so on. So the uh, communists brought all of this to, to Moscow, of course, in the hope that they might find discriminating material that they might use uh, against uh, post-war uh, opponents. The first American scholar uh, of an Austrian band who uh, got wind of this was Richard Ebeling. And Richard Ebeling, uh, when uh, he was himself working already for some time on a Mises biography, and he went to Moscow, I believe, in 1996 and uh, spent some time in the archives and got uh, copies uh, of the material. He went there with his wife, who is Russian. And uh, so carried this back and then spread the news. Yeah, there is this great uh, stuff out there. And so Lou wished to have uh, someone uh, write a biography of Mises for the Mises Institute. And just at about the same time, I had got in, in contact with the Mises Institute. I'd been in touch with them since 1994. And so they had seen me deliver papers at their conferences in 95, 96. So in January 97, I think it was, that Lou uh, wrote to me uh, an email uh, asking me whether I would be willing to do this. And this was like heaven for me because this was uh, the, my way back into academia. So that's how it started. I must say, from my perspective, this biography is an enormous contribution to the scholarship of Austrian economics. And I, I really believe that a giant like Mises deserved a more comprehensive biography than what existed when you wrote this book. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you appreciate the, the work that I did. And certainly, uh, it, it, fills, it fills a gap because no such work was available. But in all fairness, it must be said that there are not many persons who uh, have the courage to to read a book of more than a thousand pages, which it has become. So uh, the, the Mises biography is written by Murray Rothbard and by Israel Kirzner, and also Margaret von Mises books certainly have their place <laughs> and their, their, their good function, fortunately, for, for many readers who like to first have a, a Reader's Digest or a, a shorter version. Then, of course, I did something that the others couldn't do, namely uh, go through all the Mises papers, which were simply not available especially the, the pre-World War II papers. Uh, other documents had been available, namely all the material that uh, Mises left as, at his death. So his papers from his uh, decades in the United States, which his wife sold to Grove City College. So they were in Grove City College and could have been consulted uh, by, by Murray Rothbard and Israel Kiltson, but they didn't do this because uh, really, as I mentioned before, this is very painstaking archival work. It's not a great pleasure, especially if you're an economist. It's not the kind of work that you would usually do. But, I mean, that's I knew when I agreed to write the Mises biography that that is exactly what I would have to do. So it was also an experience because, well, I, I learned the trade, so to say, of, of an uh, historian, at least to some extent. Guido, let's talk for a moment about Mises' first book, which he wrote at a fairly young age, The Theory of Money and Credit. I was rereading the introduction to that book just recently, and really it's amazing how prescient it was. It could have been written today, and I'm astounded that he was able to foresee so much and write that book in 1912. Yes, it was a great achievement. And we 
at the, the occasion of the 100th uh, anniversary, uh, the centennial of, of the first publication of this book, we uh, organized a few years back a colloquium at the Austrian Scholars Conference in which uh, many um, colleagues made uh, great contributions. We published the proceedings of that colloquium uh, in a book published by the Mises Institute under the title uh, Theory of Money and Fiduciary Media, uh, Essays in Celebration of the Centennial. And uh, all of us, uh, and of course, that in a way, it's normal if you have a fresh look at, at a book, you read it again, and you, you come to appreciate this, of course, in more detail than you did before. And one of the, the marks of Mises' writing is you, at a subsequent reading, you always discover things that had escaped your notice previously, which is true for all of his great books, right? You read socialism, you read human action is always something that you thought that, that you didn't notice the first time, and you you um, finally you you see the the depth of, of his of his analysis. But uh, on the occasion of this book, so what I did was to um, uh, so I spent a lot of time preparing uh, my my chapter to this book, and what I did was to compare the uh, various editions, the, the first few German editions, then the the English edition, and I also had to look back on the. Uh, the history of monetary economics in the 19th century, which I did not do for the Mises biography. Right? So in a way, my, my chapter uh, for the centennial volume is much more in-depth than uh, what I did in the in the Mises biography. And there already, I, I, the chapter dealing with the theory of money credit contains, I, I, I think, 40 pages or something like this. So it's already big. It's just to show how, uh, how rich his monetary thought is and how great the contribution is. And what Mises, in fact, does is to... Uh, create a great synthesis of 100 years of classical monetary thought. That's what he does. So he reads all the material coming from Adam Smith and a great contribution from Adam Smith is to say, well, we cannot grow rich by having more money, and by, especially not by manipulating the money supply. Uh, so wealth comes elsewhere. It comes from hard work, comes from the division of labor. It comes from a frugal lifestyle. It comes from, from innovation and so on, but not from um, uh, the spending of money. And of course, this uh, suscitated various responses. And then there are all the money cranks also in the 19th century that who somehow had a valid point. So they could... Uh, uh, create cracks in the in the classical edifice and finally brought it to collapse because Adam Smith's monetary thought was not well developed. And so someone needed to bring all of these elements together, the valid points and the criticism, but also reinvigorate the, uh, the, 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 the true foundations that had been laid by Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Jean-Baptiste Jean Sosset. And that's what Mises does in this book. Uh, that's his great achievement. And at the same time, then he opens right, further areas for research uh, in, in the 20th century, the importance of free banking, uh, the various ways in which monetary manipulation have um, uh, impoverished us, uh, and uh, which is, for example, one of my, my research, the cultural consequences of, uh, meddling with, of government meddling with money. So the time between Mises' first book in 1912 and then writing his magnum opus, Human Action, in 1949, saw an enormous amount of changes, especially in Europe. From his perspective, he must have thought that the world was on fire and that liberalism was dying in Europe. It, it certainly was on fire. I mean, the real world was crumbling. There's a, this famous book by one of Mises' uh, contemporaries, uh, 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 the the world of yesterday, right? Uh, uh, Stefan Zweig was a famous writer, uh, still famous today, in which he described the world as it was until World War One, and as a contrast to the world that his contemporaries, because he was writing in the interwar period, and, uh, they, they noticed the big differences. And of course, for us, it's even bigger. Right? If, if you read Zweig today, and say, "Wow, this is really a completely different world," so Mises uh, saw this world on fire, as you say. And he saw that it, it collapsed in a much more dramatic way than even we uh, see it today. Of course, you look at American policy in the past 15 years, say, wow, this is really a very fast degradation. But it is nothing as compared to what Mises witnessed between uh, 1914 and, and 1949, uh, especially the, the rise of totalitarian regimes, mass murder uh, everywhere uh, in Germany, in Soviet Russia, in the various pity uh, Bolshevik uh, regimes that existed at the time. So it was a terrible time. And all the more admirable is it that he found the courage um, to carry on, uh, that he found the hope 
that one day things would be better and that he uh, realized that the intellectual foundations for any uh, renaissance of, of Western civilization would have uh, to be laid and had to be laid by somebody like him. So he filled in the gap that nobody else could fill. And he was not discouraged by the fact that few people realized how important his work was at the time. Guido, talk about Mises' experience in coming to the U.S. and the rather shabby treatment he received at the hands of American academia. If I look back at uh, the events of the past 20 years as far as career opportunities for Austrian economists are concerned, I mean, we've made uh, huge progress. Uh, so today it is possible virtually for all of our uh, young PhD uh, graduates to find a job uh, at a university or at a college. And it is increasingly possible to uh, get jobs in, in uh, well-ranked universities, well-considered universities, that is, that is possible. And I think it will also improve in the future. On the other hand, and here's the, the lesson to which you probably uh, refer to, the, the lesson is that there's still a sacrifice. If you're very brilliant, you will never make it to one, in our present uh, day, you will never make it to one of the very top schools. So there's always a sacrifice that you have to accept. Right? So you need to be motivated by other things than personal uh, success of a material sort and maybe of glory. And you need to be motivated by uh, the, the power of truth and uh, the noble dignity of justice. And of course, Murray Rothbard, like Mises, made tremendous personal sacrifices in terms of his own career to stay true to his vision of proper or correct economics. Yes. And that, I think, is the true motivation of a true scholar. You should carry for truth and you should uh, think not in a uh, temporal horizon of your own lifespan, but of many generations. That's the right approach. and it, It's the approach that can give you great satisfaction, even if your impact at your own lifetime is limited. Guido, as we wrap this up, I'd just like to raise a point that you raised in the epilogue to your biography of Mises, like Mises himself, you challenge this mainstream critique that Austrianism is somehow unscientific in its methodology. Yes. And he stressed this even more so than in human action. That, that is the subject matter of two later works that he published. One is Theory and History. And uh, the other one is Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science. So a Theory and History is a wonderful book that the Mises Institute recently uh, republished. So there's a new, uh, there's a new edition available. It was first published in 1956. And uh, the subject matter of the book is precisely what is the proper uh, scientific interpretation and what are the limits of a scientific interpretation that we can give to social history. So up to which point can science, scientific inquiry, rational methods provide us uh, sound foundation and, and true insight, true knowledge. And when does it start to become fishy? When does it start to become, to be based on pure speculation and on ideology? And precisely the, the problem of uh, positivism is that it transgresses uh, the boundaries of, uh, of reason, especially in the field of, of human action and the interpretation of society and therefore it opens the doors to ideology. Dr. Guido Holzman, thank you for your time this weekend. It's great having you here and have an excellent summer. Thanks folks, tune in next week. Mm -hmm.